1984 by George Orwell Chapter 8 From somewhere at the bottom of a passage, the smell of roasting coffee, real coffee, not victory coffee, came floating out into the street. Winston paused involuntarily, perhaps two seconds. He was back in the half-forgotten world of his childhood. Then a door banged, seeming to cut off the smell as abruptly as though it had been a sound. He had walked several kilometers over pavements, and his varicose ulcer was throbbing. This was the second time in three weeks that he had missed an evening at the community center. A rash act, since you could be certain that the number of your attendances at the center was carefully checked. In principle, a party member had no spare time and was never alone except in bed. It was assumed that when he was not working, eating or sleeping, he would be taking part in some kind of communal recreation. To do anything that suggested a taste for solitude, even to go for a walk by yourself, was always slightly dangerous. There was a word for it in Newspeak. Own life, it was called, meaning individualism and eccentricity. But this evening, as he came out of the ministry, the balminess of the April air had tempted him. The sky was a warmer blue than he had seen it that year, and suddenly the long, noisy evening at the center the boring, exhausting games, the lectures, the creaking camaraderie oiled by gin, had seemed intolerable. On impulse, he had turned away from the bus stop and wandered off into the labyrinth of London, first south, then east, then north again, losing himself amongst unknown streets and hardly bothering in which direction he was going. If there is hope, he had written in the diary, it lies in the proles. The words kept coming back to him, a statement of a mystical truth and a palpable absurdity. He was somewhere in the vague, brown-coloured slums to the north and east of what had once been St Pancras Station. He was walking up a cobbled street of little two-storey houses with battered doorways which gave straight on the pavement, which was somehow curiously suggestive of rat holes. There were puddles of filthy water here and there among the cobbles. In and out of the dark doorways and down narrow alleyways that branched off on either side, people swarmed in astonishing numbers. Girls in full bloom with crudely lipstick mouths and youths who chased the girls and swollen, waddling women who showed you what the girls would be like in ten years' time, and old bent creatures shuffling along on splayed feet, and ragged, barefooted children who played in the puddles and then scattered at angry yells from their mothers. Perhaps a quarter of the windows in the street were broken and boarded up. Most of the people paid no attention to Winston. A few eyed him with a sort of guarded curiosity. Two monstrous women with brick-red forearms folded across their aprons were talking outside a doorway. Winston caught scraps of conversation as he approached. Yes, I says to her, that's all very well, I says. But if you have been in my place, you'd have done the same thing as what I've done. It's easy to criticise, I says, but you ain't got the same problems as what I've got. Oh, said the other, that's just it. That's, that's just where it is. The strident voices stopped abruptly. The women studied him in hostile silence as he went past. But it was not hostility exactly, merely a kind of wariness, a momentary stiffening, as at the passing of some unfamiliar animal. The blue overalls of the party could not be a common sight in a street like this. Indeed, it was unwise to be seen in such places. 
unless you had definite business there. The patrols might stop you if you happen to run into them. May I see your papers, comrade? What are you doing here? What time did you leave work? Is this your usual way home? And so on and so forth. Not that there was any rule against walking home by an unusual route, but it was enough to draw attention to you if the thought police heard about it. Suddenly the whole street was in commotion. There were yells of warning from all sides. People were shooting at the doorways like rabbits. A young woman leapt out of a doorway a little ahead of Winston, grabbed up a tiny child playing in a puddle, whipped her apron around it, and leapt back again, all in one movement. At the same instant, a man in a concertina-like black suit, who had emerged from a side alley, ran towards Winston, pointing excitedly to the sky. Steamer! he yelled. Look out, governor! Bang overhead! Lie down quick! Steamer was a nickname which, for some reason, the proles applied to rocket bombs. Winston promptly flung himself on his face. The proles were nearly always right when they gave you a warning of this kind. They seemed to possess some kind of instinct, which told them several seconds in advance when a rocket was coming, although the rockets supposedly travelled faster than sound. Winston clapped his, clasped his forearms above his head. There was a roar that seemed to make the pavement heave. A shower of light objects pattered on his back. When he stood up, he found he was covered with fragments of glass from the nearest window. He walked on. The bomb had demolished a group of houses 200 meters up the street. A black plume of smoke hung in the air, and below it a cloud of plaster dust in which a crowd was already forming around the ruins. There was a little pile of plaster lying on the pavement ahead of him, and in the middle of it he could see a bright red streak. When he got up to it, he saw that it was a human hand, severed at the wrist. Apart from the bloody stump, the hand was so completely whitened as to resemble a plaster cast. He kicked the thing into the gutter, and then to avoid the crowd, turned down a side street to the right. Within three or four minutes, he was out of the area which the bomb had affected, and the, and the sordid swarming life of the streets was gone, going on as though nothing had happened. It was nearly twenty hours, and the drinking shops which the proles frequented, pubs they called them, were choked with customers. From their grimy swing doors, endlessly open and shutting, there came forth a smell of urine, sawdust and sour beer. In an angle formed by a projecting house front, three men were standing very close together, the middle one of them holding a folded up newspaper, which the other two were studying over his shoulder. Even before he was near enough to make out the expression on their faces, Winston could see absorption in every line of their bodies. It was obvious some serious piece of news that they, were, that they were reading. He was a few paces away from them when suddenly the group broke up and two of the men were in violent altercation. For a moment, they seemed almost on the point of blows. Can't you bleeding well listen to what I say? I tell ya! Now number ending in seven ain't one for over fourteen months. Yes, it has then. No, it's not. Back home, I got the whole lot of him for over two years, wrote down on a piece of paper. I take some down regular's clockwork, and I tell you, no number ending in seven. Yes, as seven as one. I could pretty near tell you the bleeding number. 407 it ended in. It were in February. Second week of February. Ferry your grandmother. I got it all down in black and white. And I tell you, no, no. Oh, pack it in, said the third man. They were talking about the lottery. Winston looked back when he had gone 30 meters. 
They were still arguing with vivid, passionate faces. The lottery, with its weekly payout of enormous prizes, was the one public event to which the proles paid serious attention. It was probable that there were some millions of proles for whom the lottery was the principal, if not the only reason, for remaining alive. It was their delight, their folly, their design, their intellectual stimulant. Where the lottery was concerned, even people who could barely read and write seemed capable of intricate calculations and staggering feats of memory. There was a whole tribe of men who made a living simply by selling systems, forecasts, and lucky amulets. Winston had nothing to do with the running of the lottery, which was managed by the Ministry of Plenty. But he was aware, indeed everyone in the party was aware, that the prizes were largely imaginary. Only small sums were actually paid out, the winners of the big prizes being non-existent persons. In the absence of any real intercommunication between one part of Oceania and another, this was not difficult to arrange. But if there was hope, it lay in the proles. You had to cling on to that. When you put it in words, it sounded reasonable. It was when you looked at the human beings passing you on the pavement that it became an act of faith. The street in which he had turned ran downhill. He had a feeling that he had been in this neighbourhood before, that there was a main thoroughfare not far away. From somewhere ahead there came a din of shouting voices. The street took a sharp turn and then ended in a flight of steps which led down into a sunken alley where a few stall-keepers were selling tired-looking vegetables. At this moment, Winston remembered where he was. The alley led out into the main street, and down the next turning, not five minutes away, was the junk shop, where he had bought the blank book, which was now his diary. And in the small stationer's shop, not far away, he had bought his pen holder and his bottle of ink. He paused for a moment at the top of the steps. On the opposite side of the alley, there, were, there was a dingy little pub whose windows appeared to be frosted over, but in reality was merely, merely coated with, a, with dust. A very old man, bent but active, with white moustaches that bristled forward like those of a prawn, pushed open the swing door and went in. As Winston stood watching, it occurred to him that the old man, who must be 80 at the least, had already been middle-aged when the revolution happened. He and a few others like him were the last links that now existed with the vanquished world of capitalism. <clears throat> In the party itself, there were not many people left whose ideas had been formed before the revolution. The older generation had mostly been wiped out in the great purges of the 50s and the 60s, and the few who survived had long ago been terrified into complete intellectual surrender. If there was anyone still alive who could give you a truthful account of conditions in the early part of the century, it could only be a prole. Suddenly the passage from the history book that he had copied into his diary came back into Winston's mind, and a lunatic impulse took hold of him. He would go into the pub, he would scrape acquaintance with that old man and question him. He would say to him, tell me about your life when you were a boy. What was it like in those days? Were things better than they are now? Or were they worse? Hurriedly, lest he should have time to become frightened, he descended the steps and crossed the narrowed street. It was madness, of course. As usual, there was no definite rule against talking to pros and frequenting their pubs. It was far too unusual an action to pass unnoticed. If the patrols appeared, he might plead an attack of faintness. But it was not likely that they would believe him. He pushed open the door, and a hideous, cheesy smell of sour beer hit him in the face. As he entered the din of voice, there entered the din. As he entered, the din of voices dropped to about half its volume. Behind his back, he could feel everyone eyeing his blue overalls. A game of darts, which was going on at the other end of the room, 
interrupted itself for perhaps as much as 30 seconds. The old man, whom he had followed, was standing at the bar, having some kind of altercation with the barman, a large, stout, hook-nosed young man with enormous forearms. A knot of others, standing around with glasses in their hands, were watching the scene. I asked you civil enough, didn't I? said the old man, straightening his shoulders pugnaciously. You tell him, eh? You ain't got a park mark in the old bleeding boozer. And what in hell's name is, is a point, said the barman, leaning forward with the tips of his fingers on the counter. Ark at him, calls yourself a barman, and don't know what a point is. Why, a pint half a quart, and there's four quarts to the gallon. I have to teach you the ABC next. Never heard of them, said the barman shortly. Litre and half litre, that's all we serve. There's the glasses on the shelf in front of you. Oh, like's a pint, persisted the old man. You could have drawn me off a, off a pint easy enough. We didn't have these bleeding litres when I was a young man. When you were a young man, we were all living in a bloody treetop, said the barman with a glance at all the other customers. There was a shout of laughter, and the uneasiness caused by Winston's entry seemed to disappear. The old man's white stubbled face had flushed pink. He turned away muttering to himself and bumped into Winston. Winston caught him gently by the arm. May I offer you a drink, he said. You're a jet, said the other, straightening his shoulders again. He appeared not to have noticed Winston's blue overalls. Point, he added aggressively to the barman. Point a wallop. The barman swished two half litres of dark brown beer into thick glasses, which he had rinsed in a bucket under the counter. Beer was the only drink he could get in a pro pub. The pros were supposed not to drink gin, though in practice they could get hold of it easily enough. The game of darts was in full swing again, and the knot of men at the bar had begun talking about lottery tickets. Winston's presence was forgotten for the moment. There was a deal table under the window where he and the old man could talk without fear of being overheard. It was horribly dangerous, but at any rate, there was no telescreen in the room, a point he had made sure of as soon as he came in. He could have drawed me off a point, grumbled the old man as he settled down behind a glass. Oh, fleet, there ain't enough. Don't satisfy an old litre's too much. Starts me bladder running, let alone the price. You must have seen great changes since you were a young man, said Winston tentatively. The old man's pale blue eyes moved from the darts board to the bar and from the bar to the door of the gents, as though it were, the la as though it were in the bar room that he expected the changes to have occurred. The beer was better, he said finally, and cheaper. When I was, a, I was a young man, mild beer, wallop we used to call it, was fortin's a pint. That was before the war, of course. Which war was that? It's all wars, said the old man vaguely. He took up his glasses and his shoulders straightened again. Here's wishing you the very best of elf. In his lean throat, the sharp pointed Adam's apple made a surprisingly rapid up and down movement, and the beer vanished. Winston went to the bar and came back with two more half litres. The old man appeared to have forgotten his prejudice against drinking a full litre. You're very much older than I am, said Winston. You must have been a grown man before I was born. You can remember what it was like in the old days. People of my age don't really know anything about those times. We can only read about them in books, and what it says in the books may not be true. I should like your opinion on that. The history books say that life before the revolution was completely different from what it is now. It was the most terrible oppression, injustice, poverty, worse than anything we can imagine. In London, the great mass of the people never had enough to eat from birth to death. Half of them hadn't even boots on their feet. They worked 12 hours a day, they left school at nine, they slept 10 in a room, and at the same time, there were a very few people, only a few thousands, the capitalists they were called, who were rich and powerful. They owned everything that there was to own. They lived in great gorgeous houses with 30 servants. They rode about in motor cars and four horse carriages. 
They drank champagne. They wore top hats. The old man brightened suddenly. Top hats, he said. Funny you should mention them. Same thing came at my head only yesterday. I don't know why. I was just thinking. I ain't seen a top hat in years. Right out they have. Last time I wore one was at my sister-in-law's funeral, and that was, well, I couldn't give you the date. But it must have been 50 years ago. Of course, it was only I for the occasion, you understand. It isn't very important about the top hat, said Winston patiently. The point is, these capitalists, they and a few lawyers and priests and so forth who lived on them, were the lords of the earth. Everything existed for their benefit. You, the ordinary people, the workers, were their slaves. They could do what they liked with you. They could ship you off to Canada like cattle. They could sleep with your daughters if they chose. They could order you to flog with something called a cat o' nine tails. You had to take your cap off when one of them passed. Every capitalist went about with a gang of lackeys who... The old man brightened again. Lackeys! Now there's a word I ain't heard since ever so long. Lackeys! That regular takes me back, that does. I recollect, oh, donkeys years ago, I, I used to go sometimes to uh, Hyde Park of a Sunday afternoon to hear the blokes making speeches. Salvation Army, Roman Catholics, Jews, Indian, Indians, all sorts there was. And there was one bloke, well, I couldn't give you his name, but a real powerful speaker he was. He didn't give off, he didn't give off, he, did, well, he didn't off give it to him. Lackeys, he says. Lackeys of the bourgeoisie, flunkies of the ruling class, parasites. That was another of them. And hyenas. Oh, I definitely call them hyenas. Of course, he was referring to the fucking Labour Party, you understand. Winston had, Winston had the feeling that they were talking across purposes. What I really wanted to know was this, he said. Do you feel that you have more freedom now than you had in those days? Are you treated more like a human being? In the old days, the rich people, the people at the top, the ass of lords, put it in the old man in reminiscently. The house of lords, if you like. What I'm asking is, were these people able to treat you as an inferior simply because they were rich and you were poor? Is it a fact, for instance, that you had to call them sir and take off your cap when you passed them? The old man appeared to think deeply. He drank off about a quarter of his beer before answering. Yeah, he said. They like you to touch your cap to him. It showed respect, but didn't agree with it myself, but I've done it often enough. Had to, as you might say. And was it usual? I'm only quoting what I've read in history books. Was it usual for these people and their servants to push you off the pavement into the gutter? One of them pushed me once, said the old man. I recollect as if it was yesterday. It was boat race night. Terribly rowdy they used to get on boat race night. And I bumped into a young bloke on Shaftesbury Avenue. Quite a gent he was. Dress shirt, top hat, black overcoat. He was a kind of zigzagging across the pavement. And I bumped into him accidental like. He says, why can't you bleed and look where you're going? He says, and I, and I say, do you think you bought the bleeding pavement? He says, I'll twist your bleeding head off, you get fresh with me. I says, you're drunk. I'll give you in I'll give you in a charge in a <laughs> I'll give you in charge in half a minute, I says. And if you believe me, he puts his hand on my chest and gives me a shove as pretty near set me under the wheels of a bus. Well I was young in them days and I was going to have him had to have fetched him one, only uh, a sense of helplessness took hold of Winston. The old man's memory was nothing but a rubbish heap of details. One could question him all day without getting any real information. Party histories might still be true after a fashion. They might even be completely true. He made a last attempt. Perhaps I've not made myself clear, he said. What I'm trying to say is this. You've been alive a very long time. You've lived half your life before the revolution. In 1925, for instance, you were already grown up. 
would you say that what you can remember that life in 1925 was better than it is now or worse? If you could choose, would you prefer to live then or now? The old man looked meditatively at the darts board. He finished up his beer more slowly than before. When he spoke, it was with a tolerant philosophical air, as though the beer had mellowed him. I know what you expect me to say, he said. You expect me to say I'd sooner be younger again. Most people would say they'd sooner be young if you asked. You've got your health and strength when you're young. When you get to my time of life, you ain't never well. I suffer something wicked from my feet. My blood is just terrible. Six and seven times a night, it has me out of my bed. On the other hand, there's great interest in being an old man. You ain't got the same worries. No truck with women, and that's a great thing. I ain't had a woman for near on 30 years. Ah, if you'd credit it. No wonder to, what's more. <clears throat> Winston sat back against the windowsill. There was no use going on. He was about to buy some more beer when the old man suddenly got up and shuffled rapidly into the stinking urinal at the sound of the room. The extra half litre was already working on him. Winston sat for a minute or two, gazing at his empty glass, and hardly noticed when his feet carried him out into the street again. Within twenty years at the most, he reflected, the huge and simple question, was life better before the revolution than it is now, would have ceased once and for all to be answerable. But in effect, it was unanswerable even now, since the few scattered survivors from the ancient world were incapable of comparing one age with another. He remembered a million useless things, a quarrel with a workmate, a hunt for a lost bicycle pump, the expression on a long dead sister's face, the swells of dust on a windy morning 70 years ago. But all the relevant facts were outside the range of their vision. They were like the ant, which can see small objects, but not large ones. And when memory failed and written records were falsified, when that happened, the claim of the party to have improved the conditions of human life had got to be accepted, because they did not exist there never again could exist any standard against which it could be tested. At this moment his train of thought stopped abruptly. He halted and looked up. He was in a narrow street with a few dark little shops interspersed among dwelling houses. Immediately above his head there hung three discoloured metal balls which looked as if they had once been gilded. He seemed to know the place. Of course! He was standing outside the junk shop where he had bought them. A twinge of fear went through him. It had been sufficiently rash of an act to buy the book in the beginning, and he had sworn never to come near the place again. And yet the instant he had allowed his thoughts to wander, his feet had brought him back here of their own accord. It was precisely against suicidal impulses of this kind that he had hoped to guard himself by opening the diary. At the same time, he noticed that although it was nearly 21 hours, the shop was still open. With the feeling that he would be less conspicuous inside than hanging about on the pavement, he stepped through the doorway. If questioned, he could plausibly say that he was trying to buy razor blades. The proprietor, the proprietor had just lighted a hanging oil lamp which gave off an unclean smell. He was a man, perhaps of sixty, frail and bowed, with a long benevolent nose and mild eyes, distorted by thick spectacles. His hair was almost white, his eyebrows were bushy and still black. His spectacles, his gentle, fussy movements, and the fact he was wearing an aged jacket of black velvet, gave him a vague air of intellectuality, as though he had been some kind of literary man, or perhaps a musician. His voice was soft, as though faded, and his accent less debased than that of the majority of proles. I recognised you on the pavement, he said immediately. You're the gentleman that bought the young lady's keepsake album. That was a beautiful bit of paper, that was. 
Cream Lied, it used to be called. There's been no paper like that made for, ooh, I dare say, 50 years. He appeared at Winston over the top of his spectacles. Is there anything special can do for you? Or did you just want to look around? I was passing, said Winston vaguely. I just looked in. I don't want anything in particular. It's just as well, said the other. Because I don't suppose it could have satisfied you. He made an ap apologetic gesture with his soft-palmed hand. You see how it is. An empty shop, you might say. Between you and me, the antique trade's just about finished. No demand any longer, and no stock either. Furniture, china, glass, it's all been broken up by degrees, and of course the metal stuff's mostly been melted down. I haven't seen a brass candlestick in years. The tiny interior of the shop was in fact uncomfortably full. There was almost nothing in it of the slightest value. The floor space was very restricted because all around the walls were stacked innumerable dusty picture frames. In the window, there were trays of nuts and bolts, worn out chisels, pen knives with broken blades, tarnished watches that did not even pretend to be go in going order, and other miscellaneous rubbish. Only on a small table in the corner was there a litter of odds and ends, lacquered snuff boxes, agate brooches and the like which looked as though they might include something interesting. As Winston wandered towards the table, his eye was caught by a round, smooth thing that gleamed softly in the lamplight, and he picked it up. It was a heavy lump of glass, curved on one side, flat on the other, making almost a hemisphere. There was a peculiar softness, as of rainwater, in both the colour and the texture of the glass. At the heart of it, magnified by the curved surface, there was a strange pink convoluted object recalled a rose or a sea anemone. What is it? said Winston, fascinated. That's coral, that is, said the old man. It must have come from the Indian Ocean. It used to kind of embed it in the glass. That hasn't been made less than a hundred years ago, more by the look of it. It's a beautiful thing, said Winston. It is a beautiful thing, said the other appreciatively. There's not many that say so no nowadays, he coughed. Now, if it so happened that you wanted to buy it, that would cost you four dollars. I can remember when a thing like that would have fetched eight pounds, and eight pounds was, well, I can't work it out. It was a lot of money. But who cares about genuine antiques nowadays? even the few that's left. Winston immediately paid over the four dollars and slid the coveted thing into his pocket. What appealed to him about it was not so much its beauty as the air it seemed to possess of belonging to an age quite different from the present one. The soft, rain-watery glass was not like any glass he had ever seen. The thing was doubly attractive because of its apparent uselessness though he could guess that it must once have been intended as a paperweight. It was very, but fortunately, it did not make much of a bulge. It was a queer thing, even a compromising thing for a party member to have in his possession. Anything old, and for that matter anything beautiful, was always vaguely suspect. The old man had grown noticeably more cheerful after receiving the four dollars. Winston realised that he would have except at three, or even two. There's some upstairs you might care to take a look at, he said. Not much in it, just a few pieces. We'll do with a lot for going upstairs. He lit another lamp, and with a bowed back, led the way slowly up the steep and worn stairs and along a tiny passage into a room which did not get, which did not give on the street, but looked out on a cobbled yard and a forest of chimney pots. Winston noticed that the furniture was still arranged as though the room were meant to be lived in. There was a strip of carpet on the floor, a picture or two on the walls, and a deep slatternly armchair drawn up to the fireplace. An old-fashioned glass clock with a 12-hour face was ticking away on the mantelpiece. Under the window, a 
and occupying nearly a quarter of the room was an enormous bed, the mattress still on it. We lived here till my wife died, said the old man half apologetically. I'm selling the furniture off by little and little. Now that's a beautiful mahogany bed, or at least it would be if we get the bugs out of it. But I dare say you'd find it a little bit cumbersome. He was holding the lamp high up so as to illuminate the whole room, and in the warm, dim light the place looked curiously inviting. The thought flitted through Winston's mind that it would probably be quite easy to rent the room for a few dollars a week if he dared to take the risk. It was a wild, impossible notion to be abandoned as soon as he thought of, but the room had awakened in him a sort of nostalgia, a sort of ancestral memory. It seemed to him that he knew exactly what it felt like to sit in a room like this, in an armchair, watch, uh, armchair with nobody watching you, no voice pursuing you, no sound except the singing of the kettle and the friendly ticking of the clock. There's no telescreen, he could not help murmuring. Ah, said the old man, I never had one of those things. Too expensive, and I never seem to feel the need of it anywhere. Now that's a nice gate-leg table in the corner there. Though of course, you'd have to put a few hinges on it if you wanted to use the flaps. There was a small bookcase in the other corner, and Winston had already gravitated towards it. It contained nothing but rubbish. The hunting down and destruction of books had been done with the same thoroughness in the pro quarters as everywhere else. It was very unlikely that there existed anywhere in Oceania a copy of a book printed earlier than 1960. The old man, still carrying the lamp, was standing in front of a picture in a rosewood frame which hung uh, on the other side of the fireplace opposite the bed. Now, if you happen to be interested in old prints at all, he began delicately. Winston came across to examine the picture. It was a steel engraving of an oval building with rectangular windows and a small tower in front. There was a railing running around the building, and at the rear end there appeared to be a statue. Winston gazed at it for some moments. It seemed vaguely familiar, though he did not much remember the statue. The frame has fixed the wall, said the old man. But I could unscrew it for you, I dare say. I know that building, said Winston finally. It's a ruin now. It's the middle of the street outside the Palace of Justice. That's right, outside the law courts. It was bombed in, oh, many years ago. It was a church at one time. St. Clement Danes, its name was. He smiled apologetically, as though conscious of saying something slightly ridiculous, and added, Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. What's that, said Winston? Oh, Origins and lemons, say the bells of St. Clement's. That was a rhyme we had when I was a little boy. How it goes on, I don't remember. But I do know it ended up, Here comes a candle to light you to bed. Here comes a chopper to chop off your head. It was a kind of dance. They held out their arms for you to pass under, and when they came to, here comes a chopper to chop off your head. They brought their arms down and caught you. It was just names of churches. All the London churches were in it. All the principal ones, that is. Winston wondered vaguely to what century the church belonged. It was always difficult to determine the age of, lo of a London building. Anything large and impressive, if it was reasonably new in appearance, was automatically claimed as having been built since the Revolution. Well, anything that was obviously of an earlier date was ascribed to some dim period called the Middle Ages. The centuries of capitalism were held to have produced nothing of any value. One could not learn history from architecture any more than one could learn it from books. Statues, inscriptions, memorial stones, the names of streets, anything that might throw light upon the past had been systematically altered. I never knew it had been a church, he said. There's a lot of them left, really, said the old man. But you've been put to those uses. Now, how did that rhyme go? Oh, I've got it. 
Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. Yell me free farthing, say the bells of St. Martin's. There now, that's as far as I can get. A farthing, that was a small copper coin. Looked something like a cent. Where was St. Martin's, said, said Winston. St. Martin's? That's still standing. It's in Victory Square, alongside the picture gallery. A building with a kind of triangular porch and pillars in front, and a big flight of steps. Winston knew the place well. It was a museum used for propaganda displays of various kinds. Scale models of rocket bombs and floating fortresses, waxwork tableau illustrating enemy atrocities and the like. St. Martin's in the Fields, it used to be called, supplemented the old man. Though I don't recall, recollect any fields anywhere in those parts. Winston did not buy the picture. It would have been an even more incongruous possession than the glass paperweight and impossible to carry home, unless it were taken out of its frame. But he lingered for some minutes more, talking to the old man, whose name he discovered was not Weeks, as one might have gathered from the inscription of the shop front, but Charrington. Mr. Charrington, it seemed, was a widower, aged 63, and had inhabited this shop for 30 years. Throughout that time, he had been intending to alter the name of the window, but had never quite got the point of doing it. All the while that they were talking, the half-remembered rhyme kept running through Winston's head. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me by far, say the bells of St. Martin's. It was curious, but when you said it to yourself, you had the illusion of actually hearing bells. The bells of a lost London that still existed somewhere or other, disguised and forgotten. From one ghostly steeple after another, he seemed to hear them peering forth. But so far as he could remember, he had never in real life heard church bells ringing. He got away from Mr. Charrington and went down the stairs alone so as not to let the old man see him reconnoitring the street before stepping out the door. He had already made up his mind that after a suitable interval, a month, say, he would take the risk of visiting the shop again. It was perhaps not more dangerous than shirking an evening at the centre. A serious piece of folly had been to come back here in the first place after buying the diary without knowing whether the proprietor of the shop could be trusted. However, yes, he thought again. He would come back. He would buy further scraps of beautiful rubbish. He would buy the engraving of St. Clement Danes, take it out of its frame and carry it home, concealed under the jacket of his overalls. He would drag the rest of that poem out of Mr. Charrington's, Charrington's memory. Even the lunatic project of renting the room upstairs flashed momentarily through his mind again. For perhaps five seconds, exaltation made him careless, and he stepped onto the pavement without so much as a preliminary glance through the window. He had even started humming to an improvised tune. Oranges and lemons, say the bells of St. Clements. You owe me three farthings, say that. Suddenly his heart seemed to turn to ice and his bowels to water. A figure in blue overalls was coming down the pavement, not ten metres away. It was the girl from the fiction department. The girl with dark hair. The light was failing, but was no difficulty in recognising her face. She looked him straight in the face, then walked quickly on as though she had never seen him. For a few seconds, Winston was too paralysed to move. And he turned to the right and walked heavily away, not noticing for the moment that he was going in the wrong direction. At any rate, one question was settled. There was no doubting any longer that the girl was spying on him. She must have followed him here, but it was not credible that by pure chance she should have happened to be walking on the same evening up the same obscure back street, kilometres distant from any quarter where party members lived. It was too great a coincidence. Whether she, was really an agent of, whether she was really an agent of the thought police or simply an amateur spy, actuated by officiousness, hardly mattered. 
it was enough that she was watching him. Probably she had seen him go into the pub as well. It was an effort to walk. A lump of glass in his pocket banged against his thigh at each step. He was half-minded to take it out and throw it away. The worst thing was the pain in his belly. For a couple of minutes, he had the feeling that he would die if he did not reach a lavatory soon. There would be no public lavatories in a quarter like this. Then the spasm passed, leaving a dull ache behind. The street was a blind alley. Winston halted, stood for several seconds, wondering vaguely what to do, then turned around and began to retrace his steps. As he turned, it occurred to him that the girl had only passed him three minutes ago, and that by running he could probably catch up with her. He could keep on her, he could keep on her track till they were in some quiet place, and then smash her skull in with a cobblestone. The piece of glass in his pocket would be heavy enough for the job. He abandoned the idea immediately, because even the thought of making any physical effort was unbearable. He could not run, he could not strike a blow. Besides, she was young and lusty and could defend. He thought also of hurrying to the community centre and staying there till the place closed, so to establish a partial alibi for the evening. But that too was impossible. A deadly lassitude had taken hold of him. All he wanted was to get home quickly and then sit down and be quiet. It was after 22 hours when he got back to the flat. The lights would be switched off at the main at 23.30. He went into the kitchen and swallowed nearly a teacup full of victory gin. Then he went to the table in the, in the alcove, sat down and took the diary out of the drawer. But he did not open it at once. From the telescreen, a brassy female voice was squalling a patriotic song. He sat staring at the marble cover of the book, trying without success to shut the voice out of his consciousness. It was at night that they came for you, always at night. The proper thing was to kill yourself without you. Undoubtedly, some people did so. Many of the disappearances were actually suicides. But it needed desperate courage to kill yourself in a world where firearms or any quick and certain poison were completely improcurable. He thought with a kind of astonishment of the biological uselessness, uselessness of pain and fear the treachery of the human body which always freezes into inertia at exactly the moment when special effort is needed. He might have silenced the dark-haired girl if only he had acted quickly enough, but precisely because of the extremity of his danger, he had lost the power to act. It struck him that in moments of crisis, one is never fighting against an external enemy, but always against one's own body. Even now, in spite of the gin, the dull ache in his belly made consecutive thought possible, impossible. And it's the same, he perceived, in all seemingly heroic or tragic situations, on the battlefield, in the torture chamber, on a sinking ship. The issues that you are fighting for are always forgotten because the body swells up until it fills the universe. And even when you're not paralyzed by fright or screaming with pain, life is a moment-to-moment -moment struggle against hunger or cold or sleeplessness, against a sour stomach or an aching tooth. He opened the diary. It was important to write something down. The woman on the telescreen had started a new song. Her voice seemed to stick into his brain like jagged splinters of glass. He tried to think of O'Brien, for whom, or to whom, the diary was written. And instead, he began thinking of the things that would happen to him after the thought police took him away. It would not matter if they killed you at once. To be killed was what you expected. But before death, nobody spoke of such things, yet everybody knew of them. There was the routine of confession that had to be gone through, the groveling on the floor, and screaming for mercy, the crack of broken, broken bones, the smashed teeth, and bloody clots of hair. Why did you have to endure it? 
since the end was always the same. Why was it not possible to cut a few days or weeks out of your life? Nobody ever escaped detection, and nobody ever failed to confess. When once you had succumbed to thought crime, it was certain that by a given date you would be dead. Why then did that horror, which altered nothing, have to lie embedded in future time? He tried with a little more success than before to summon up the image of O'Brien. We shall meet in the place where there is no darkness, O'Brien had said to him. He knew what it meant, or thought he knew. The place where there is no darkness was the imagined future, which one could never see, but, but which, by foreknowledge, one could mystically share in. With the voice from the telescreen nagging at his ears, he could not follow the train of thought further. He put a cigarette in his mouth. Half the tobacco promptly fell out onto his tongue, a bit of dust which was difficult to spit out again. The face of Big Brother swam, swam into his mind, displacing that of mine, just as he had done a few days earlier. He slid a coin out of his pocket and looked at it. The face gazed up at him, heavy, calm, protecting. But what kind of smile was hidden beneath the dark moustache? Like a leaden knell, the words came back at him. War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength.